Tonight, a Canadian teen falls from the top of a mountain and survives. Instinctively, I was just trying to stop myself. Like, I was fighting for my life. He plunged 150 meters, nearly 500 feet, and he's telling his story to CBC News. I'd say to anybody, don't stay, just go. Devastation in parts of Australia, and it's only going to get worse. How much sugar is lurking in your children's food? The answer may surprise you. Life in the desert. An unusual roadblock traps drivers on New Year's Eve. This is The National. A BC teenager is in a U.S. hospital tonight, injured, but incredibly, given what he's endured, he's alive and relatively well. He fell about 150 meters off an icy mountain in Oregon. Today, in his first television interview, he told the CBC's Olivia Stefanovic how he survived. This was 16-year-old Gerba Singh's mission, scaling Oregon's highest peak. But instead of reaching the summit, he was taken off in a stretcher. It happened so fast, I'm just processing all of it right now. Singh set off for the top of Mount Hood early Monday with friends. Conditions clear, he was just below the final push, in an area called the Pearly Gates, when he slipped on a broken piece of ice, sending him 150 meters straight down. Instinctively, I was just trying to stop myself. Like, I was fighting for my life, basically. Singh says he tried to keep his knees up, but his foot got caught, fracturing his leg. Singh landed in what's known as the Devil's Kitchen, a section of the dormant volcano surrounded by cliffs. There, he waited hours in the cold for rescue. I'm so thankful for everyone who helped me, and, like, they, they kept me awake, and they just held my mood because it hurt a lot. Even though the route Singh was taken wasn't extremely technical, the mountain has seen more than 130 deaths. It's not uncommon for people to fall and, and, and be killed um, up there. Climber Chris Bremer knows the risks well. He's ascended Mount Hood 10 times, even with his teenage son. You just need to do enough um, that, that you're comfortable um, in snow and ice, um, that you understand the risks, um, and hopefully you understand um, whether you're in over your head or, um, or, or what you're doing is something that's within your skill set. Singh says he knew what he was getting into. This would have been his 98th summit. He documents his journeys on social media, where he's known as Teen Mountaineer. It makes me feel happy, like, like I've conquered something bigger than myself. Singh plans to ease back into the sport. He says it will take six weeks until he can fully put weight back on his left leg. And then there will be more mountains to climb. Olivia Stevanovic, CBC News, Toronto. The death toll from Australia's wildfire crisis rose by five today. That brings the nationwide total to 17. And there are concerns the number could rise as more extreme heat is in the forecast. But for some, today was much calmer as winds eased, bringing a welcome break. But that also keeps thick smoke from dispersing. In the capital of Canberra, air quality was reportedly the worst in the world. Salima Shivji shows us how victims of the bushfires are coping. After the flames have come and gone, the sheer scale of the devastation starts to sink in. It was just a big red glow and it was roaring. It flattened entire neighbourhoods, some still smouldering. I don't know what I'm going home to, so I, ha I just hope for the best. But others battle feelings of helplessness. I stayed and fought, yeah, but I'd say to anybody, don't stay, just go. The wind just blew and every, you look at everything, I mean, it's just grass, it's just everything. Everywhere you go, it left nothing. Nothing left either for those returning home to the town of Malakuta, where several thousand had escaped to the beach as the fire got closer. Like you walk around a bit of your house and you just go, oh, that was the bedroom and all oh, just my baby memories from my kids and just everything, just gone. Here, at least, a chance to mourn those losses. But in the neighbouring state of New South Wales, more than 100 wildfires are still burning, half of them out of control. Canada sent in help weeks ago, fire experts to coordinate forces on the ground. After Australia did the same for BC, over two years of crippling wildfires. People have that sense that, you know, they came and helped us in a time of need, so we're more than willing to come and help in their time of need. 
that help still sorely needed. Officials have called in more military to reach areas cut off by fire. When people have lost everything, it's very difficult to console them, but, but what we can do is just make sure that they know they're supported. A thick haze lingers, and even though temperatures have cooled, it's only a temporary respite. There is every potential that the conditions on Saturday will be as bad or worse. The winds are expected to be very strong, back to 40 plus degrees temperatures. Um, we've got a lot of fire in the landscape that we will not contain. As the weekend looms, officials have this extreme warning for Australia's south coast. Get out. It's not safe. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. One dramatic image has gone viral because it seems to sum up Australia's plight. You can see the steely concentration in this boy's eyes as he steers the family boat away from the Malakuta shore to take shelter on a sand barrier. His mother took the photo two days ago and millions have seen it since. 11-year-old Finn Burns said he wasn't all that fussed about his sudden fame. Both his parents are firefighters, he said. So the family had a plan and they followed it. Turns out their home was spared by the wildfire. More than 50 neighbours weren't so lucky. It is a new year, but old grievances remain in Hong Kong. Hundreds of thousands of pro-democracy protesters took to the streets. As Carolyn Dunn reports, the escalating police response is leading to increased concern in Canada. A new decade in Hong Kong begins in chaos, with police cracking down on protesters. Police have made around 400 arrests. Offences include unlawful assembly and possession of offensive weapons. What began last year as protests over an extradition bill has morphed into demands for democracy, sending hundreds of thousands into the streets. This is the first day of 2020, and I think we have rest enough and it is a time for us to tell the world that we haven't given up yet. I hope the government will listen to what the people are actually demanding. To the Chinese government, the protesters are rioters, an urgent threat to authority. Hong Kong's prosperity and stability is the wish of Hong Kong compatriots, Chinese President Xi Jinping said in his New Year's message. It's the expectation of the people of our motherland. And undoubtedly, shows like this are the biggest internal challenge to Xi's iron-fisted rule he has ever faced. The police tactics used to try to quell them are garnering unflattering international scrutiny. Dignitaries from 18 countries have written an open letter expressing grave concerns at the recent escalation of police brutality over the Christmas period. Signatories from Canada include former Secretary of State David Kilgore, former Ontario Premier and Federal MP Bob Ray, and MP Kenny Chu. The protesters say they will keep coming out in this new year, this new decade. No matter who is being threatened or facing suppression, this political activist says, we will not give up on them. We will not forget what we are fighting for. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, London. A longtime U.S. adversary has returned to his aggressive ways. North Korea's Kim Jong-un has signaled that he's prepared to resume testing nuclear and long-range missiles. Moratoriums have been in place after talks with President Trump. If Chairman Kim has reneged on the commitments he made to President Trump, that is deeply disappointing. I was there when Chairman Kim made the commitment that said he would not engage in uh, intercontinental missiles or test firing of uh, their nuclear weapons, testing their nuclear weapon systems. He made those commitments to President Trump in exchange for President Trump agreeing uh, not to conduct large-scale military exercises. We've lived up to our commitments. We continue to hold out hope that he'll live up to his as well. It was at a meeting of party officials this week that Kim announced the test ban was no longer needed. In addition, he said North Korea was planning to introduce a new strategic weapon in the near future. Meanwhile, in Baghdad today, a step back from a deepening crisis in that part of the world. After two days, Iranian-supported militias have ended their siege on the U.S. Embassy, and the compound has been secured. Jacqueline Hansen now on what was accomplished. Supplies that made it look like protesters were prepared to stay, now being packed up and driven away. We are committed to the calm, this man says. 
a dramatic shift from just hours earlier when fires burned outside the U.S. Embassy and crowds of Iraqi supporters of an Iran-backed militia remained, still angry over the U.S. airstrikes that killed 25 fighters. They decided to withdraw, but they made their point, which is they can bring large numbers of demonstrators, they can create a political crisis, they can put the United States in the hot seat. For more than a year, President Trump has put the pressure on Iran, squeezing its economy with severe sanctions. But last night, the president said he wants peace, not war. I don't think Iran would want that to happen. It would go very quickly. Today, Iran's leader says he doesn't foresee war either. But if anyone attempts to use force against his country, he says Iran will use all of its strength in return. This Middle East expert says the United States' latest attempt to target Iran has largely backfired. What happened in Iraq is really a major misstep by the United States potentially alienating other Iraqis who have been trying to push Iran's influence out of their country for months. The United States saw this as a really positive step of Iraqis standing up to Iran. But by an ill-advised and ill-conceived attack, it has angered Iraqi nationalism and it has diverted attention from Iran onto itself. Now that Iran has shown it can put pressure on Washington, some experts say President Trump will need a new approach, one that replaces the tough tactics with diplomacy. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Washington. Other stories we're watching tonight here in Canada. Three people were killed in a single car crash on Highway 17. That's southwest of Sudbury. The car slamming into a rock face. Two other people in the car were hurt, but not the driver. The highway was closed for several hours. And fires forced residents out of a homeless shelter in Gatineau, Quebec. It broke out late last night behind the building and entered through a kitchen fan. A soup kitchen has taken in some of the evacuees. Arrangements are being made to house the rest. It will be weeks before the shelter is ready to take them back. No one was hurt. Think of homeless youth and you might picture teens sleeping on city streets or in shelters. But a pilot project north of Toronto is working to prevent just that. As Nicole Ireland explains, it connects young people in need with families willing to help. So Lloyd, you want to be a surveyor? Until a few yeah, months ago, tactics, Lloyd strategy. thought his plans to go to college and start his career were on track. Then the grade 12 student's life was thrown into uncertainty. We had some family issues at home and uh, I was given a six week notice to depart from my home. CBC News is withholding Lloyd's last name because homelessness carries a stigma. The Canadian-born 18-year-old grew up in Jamaica but returned here to live with his cousin until he graduated high school. When that arrangement fell apart, Lloyd's guidance counselor told him about Night Stop. So this is your room here. This is very a program that places young people at risk of becoming homeless in spare rooms offered by volunteer families like Kirk and Amy Schuler. They get to stay in an extra room that they have, and it's lovely. They will always uh, text you first thing on Monday. The couple and their two kids have been night stop hosts for several young people. Lloyd impressed them immediately. Very friendly, shook hands, super polite. Would eat anything, not a picky eater. So it. It was so easy to just have them here. And we do have Still, for most families, the idea of welcoming a stranger into their home takes some getting used to. Lots of questions. Is this going to be dangerous? Is this appropriate for our small family, our young family? We do Skype calls. All basis. common concerns, Night Stop organizers say. Concerns they address through rigorous screening of the young people they place in homes. We're not um, putting kids in families that have significant mental illness um, or significant addictions. You know, our families that we're placing with, they're not social workers and they're not expected to be. Since it started in York Region in 2017, Night Stop has placed 44 young people in host homes. Now there are plans to expand the program across Canada, a move applauded by experts, because when youth end up on the streets, the consequences are dire. Their health declines, mental health declines, they experience trauma, they're more likely to be victims of crime, uh, and often uh, addictions are an outcome because of all of those things. For Lloyd, knowing he has somewhere safe to spend the night has allowed him to focus on doing well in school. So well, he's already received conditional acceptance letters from two colleges. Nicole Ireland, CBC News.
Heffer Law, Ontario. We're back in two minutes with more news. What's behind your toddler's sweet tooth? The food you're buying may have more sugar than you think. And later. Call it tumble getting the surreal scene that left drivers trapped along a highway for hours. Many parents try to stay clear of feeding their infants and toddlers added sugar. But researchers say babies as young as six months old are getting it anyway. Christine Birak tells us the food sugar is lurking in and what experts recommend to avoid it. Hi, guys. Hi. Do you want a little bit? Hey. Come on. 11 month old twins Come Sam on. and Jake Open here are out. pretty good eaters. So is their big sister, yeah. Noelle. They all need small bites of nutritious food. What they don't need is someone adding sugar to sweeten that food. But researchers say it's happening. So sometimes it can sneak into foods that we don't always expect to see it in. A recent study found nearly two-thirds of infants and almost all toddlers are eating added sugars. Problem is, early eating habits in life often shape later eating patterns. Research has shown too much added sugar is associated with cavities, asthma, obesity, high blood pressure, and cholesterol issues. This was 18 grams in this. And experts know yes. in part what's feeding their sweet tooth. You, uh... In the last 30 or so years, we have seen a real increase in this idea that kids need their own kinds of foods, right? That there's aisles now that are here's baby food, here's toddler food, here's transition food. The top food sources of added sugars for infants included yogurts, baby snacks, and sweet bakery products. For toddlers, throw in fruit drinks. And it's not always easy to tell from the label. There are over 100 different names used for sugar. Uh, we have sugar. We have sugar syrup. Uh, I think corn and barley malt extract may also be sugar. To help shoppers, as of January 1st, American food makers now identify the amount of total and added sugars on food products. Health Canada decided against that approach. Instead, it's asking companies to list all sugars together on the label and offer a percent daily value. And the reason that's helpful is then we can say to folks, if it has less than 5% of your daily value, that's a low in sugar product. Mm -hmm. And if it has greater than 15% of the uh, daily value, that's a product high in sugar. Canadians will have to wait until 2022 for those new sugar labels. Perfect. But for parents, okay. it's a daily struggle. Ideally, your kids won't develop such a strong sense of urgency for eating sugar all the time, except at Halloween. <laughs> Their family strategy is to eat together and cook as many healthy meals as possible. But in a busy household like this one, sometimes a little baby snack can go a long way. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Some other stories we're following tonight on The National. Tough new cannabis laws are now in effect in Quebec. The new legislation passed in November prohibits people under 21 from buying or possessing cannabis, jumping up from the previous legal age of 18. Most other provinces have set the age at 19. The new laws also place more restrictions on where the drug can be consumed and introduces an outright ban on the sale of sugary cannabis edibles. Meanwhile, here in Ontario, new regulations mean ads for vaping products will no longer be allowed in convenience stores and gas stations, bringing vaping rules in line with the current ban on in-store tobacco promotion. The province says the move is in response to the rising number of young people vaping. New restrictions also take effect today in British Columbia. They include a higher sales tax, restrictions on advertising and packaging, and limits on nicotine content. Well, people in Saskatchewan were treated to a rare spectacle as an apparent meteor lit up the night sky over the weekend. Doorbell and security cameras capturing the moment in Saskatoon. Experts say sky watchers may want to keep their eyes peeled for the next few nights as this is part of a larger meteor shower that is set to peak on Friday and Saturday. And more than 30,000 people greeted the new year without power in British Columbia after a snowstorm caused extensive damage to hydro infrastructure. The central and southern interior were the hardest hit areas. BC Hydro says crews have been brought in from other parts of the province to restore power. Snowfall expected to continue through the night.
After the break, a virtual experience into a community's painful past. How technology is teaching and empowering a whole new generation. Plus, we revisit a conversation with former U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice. I refuse to bet against uh, America's ability to, to grow and renew itself um, and to heal. Her thoughts on impeachment and the year ahead in American politics. That's next. In Nova Scotia, high school students are using virtual reality to learn about a painful part of their province's past. The Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children opened nearly 100 years ago and was allegedly the site of mistreatment and abuse. As Kayla Housel explains, teaching about it is part of the province's commitment to recognize systemic racism. 15-year-old Shakima Johnson says she didn't know anything about the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children until she got a virtual experience, even though it's located across the street from her family's church. I really just thought it was just a home. I was like, they're doing good in the community, but I didn't know that they actually did that much harm to children and didn't deserve it. It's something that went on for decades, uh, for generations. Tony Smith, a fair-skinned black child, was one of them. And there was a very traumatic experience that I witnessed of my friend taking a beating that um, ended up causing his death. And the way that the home covered it up, it made me feel that they can do whatever they want to you, that my life is nothing. Smith helped launch a class action lawsuit that resulted in settlements totaling $34 million in 2014. The Premier issued a public apology and launched a restorative inquiry. This pilot project in two high school classrooms is part of that commitment. The inquiry was designed to help people learn and understand the history of the home, its significance for the province, and how we come to understand central issues around uh, systemic racism and the way forward for the province. Oh, it feels like you're in the house. The virtual reality experience allows you to hear from three former residents of the home. I was five years old. They tell stories of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, but also talk about people who try to help them. Ms. Johnson, who was the cook at the home, uh, and she would always sneak him a bread and butter on the, sh on the ledge because she knew he was always hungry. Well, doing the project made me feel really connected to like my culture. Though. The two-week curriculum provides time for the students to share their feelings. You can read a book, but you're never actually going to understand it until you really like see it and get to kind of, I mean, you're not really ever going to experience what they experience, but you kind of get to see what their life was like. It's very empowering and it's something that I'll never get tired of. There are plans to implement the program in schools across the province. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Cole Harbour, Nova Scotia. We'll be right back with a look at stories developing around the world, including an apology from Pope Francis after this strange moment caught on camera. And a conversation with former U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice about the state of American politics and her advice for Canada. Welcome back. Pope Francis has apologized for slapping the hand of a well-wisher in St. Peter's Square. During his New Year's Day wishes to the public, he said, love makes us patient. So many times we lose patience, even me, and I apologize for yesterday's bad example. Last night, the Pope was greeting pilgrims as he made his way to a nativity scene. When he turned away, a woman grabbed his hand and yanked him towards her. Pope Francis responded by slapping her hands and pulling away. In Indonesia, at least nine people are dead and nearly 200,000 have been forced from their homes after torrential rain flooded Jakarta overnight. Some areas saw water levels rise as high as two meters. And a German zoo was badly damaged after fire ripped through a monkey enclosure, killing at least 30 animals inside. Investigators say the fire broke out shortly after midnight and it may have been caused by sky lanterns used to celebrate New Year's. Only two chimpanzees survived the blaze. Community members have set up a memorial outside the zoo. Former NBA Commissioner David Stern has died. The 77-year-old had spent the last couple of weeks in a hospital after suffering a brain hemorrhage. Stern led the NBA for three decades and his tenure included building the league into a multi-billion dollar corporation. He was also credited with helping to bring the Toronto Raptors and Vancouver Grizzlies into the NBA during the mid-1990s. 
The former commissioner was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2014. 2019 in the United States was consumed with the impeachment drama, and this year is likely to start off the same way. Adding the campaign for president and 2020 is shaping up to be a challenging and divisive year. Someone with a unique perspective on all of this, Susan Rice. The former national security advisor spent more time in that role than all of Trump's NSAs combined. Adrian sat down with her on the one year mark before that pivotal election. Ambassador Susan Rice is a Washington heavyweight. She spent years working with President Barack Obama, becoming a vital voice in his administration. Protest began outside of our consulate in Benghazi. First as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, later as his national security advisor. Throughout it all, she's been tough and direct. Happens to have a lot to say about Washington now in her own full-throated way. Because Lindsey Graham isn't just a piece of now. He's Lindsay, been a piece of shit. Lindsey Graham. I said it. <laughs> she is back in the public eye. We sure as hell need to agree that a hostile foreign power has no business messing with our elections. Her new memoir is called Tough Love and chronicles her time on the front lines of American politics and what a battlefield that is. I met up with Ambassador Rice in Washington. Ambassador Rice, thank you very, very much. Really, really appreciate this. Congratulations on the Nationals, I think. Thank you. I gather this thank is very you. important to you. It, well, of course. <laughs> Washington native, we have to celebrate these things. It is a precisely a year until the Americans go to the polls again. How do you feel now about where the country is at, one year out? Well, I, you know, I, I think that Democrats are likely to win. I think that the American people uh, have seen a lot of Donald Trump now and much of the downside uh, of his leadership, which is, you know, rife with dishonesty, rife with self-interest domestically and in terms of foreign policy. And, you know, it's very hard to predict where the impeachment inquiry will end up and I, uh, whether or not that leads to removal, which I think is unlikely, uh, I think it will um, deepen concerns among the American public. How do you feel about this whole process happening a year out? Look, I think I, like a lot of uh, Democratic uh, voters and Democratic members of Congress, <clears throat> came to the judgment belatedly an impeachment inquiry was necessary. When the Ukraine uh, transcript came to light and the absolute clarity that it seems to uh, mm -hmm. demonstrate about the president's interests in, you know, extorting uh, dirt on a political rival, mm -hmm. false dirt on a political rival, for his own personal gain, and to hold up congressionally approved military assistance to a country that needs it desperately because of Russian aggression. It's so outrageous. It's such an abuse of power. There is a real divide in this country. And I think I was a bit taken aback, because I, I, I know that it's very personal for people, the divisions. But I didn't know that you're experiencing the divisions within your own family. Your own son, Jake, is completely politically opposite from you. And not completely, but he's a, he's a staunch conservative. And as I write in the book, there are areas where we agree. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more areas where we disagree, uh, particularly on domestic policy. Um, but he's my son, and I'm very proud of him. I love him to death, just as I love my daughter, who's a bit younger and quite a bit to the left. So we've got a bit of both in our household. Uh, and my husband, Ian, and I are somewhat in the middle trying to uh, keep the food from flying at the dinner table. Does it make you look at this country a little differently, though, with a, it a does. bit more empathy for, for the divides? I actually feel quite fortunate uh, that I have the, an insight into how a substantial portion of people in this country are thinking. And I, you know, I try to understand it and to, to be respectful of those differences. And so one of the gifts that um, our son Jake has given us is um, a broader perspective and a, a sense of urgency about the importance of trying to find common ground. Do you think Americans are, at, at this moment are, are able to reconcile those differences? I think we have to. I refuse to bet against uh, America's ability to, to grow and renew itself um, and to heal. And so, yes, this is a difficult time. Is it the most difficult? No way. Uh, 
can we do it? Yes, but the, the nature of the challenges are somewhat different given this new political and media environment. You know, if we don't confront these divisions with a sense of urgency and uh, necessity, that they could be uh, what undermines our, not only our global leadership, but our democracy. As you know, Canada's relationship with China right now is really raw and not very good, and, and stemming largely from that arrest of Meng Wanzhou as he of. Should Canada have been asked to arrest her by the Americans? I think yes. There was, I assume, significant uh, evidence to suggest that she had um, committed a crime. W what worries me, though, is then the way President Trump suggested, having asked for the arrest, mm -hmm. that, you know, we might trade her at your expense you know, in the context of, you know, some trade negotiation, if it were beneficial in his estimation uh, to get what we want in the trade deal. That's not right. Knowing the Chinese leadership the way you do and the way it works, how does Canada get out of this? You know, I don't think Canada benefits from caving. And I realize that, you know, they're citizens that, who are in detention and that it's a very uncomfortable and, and, and unpleasant place to be. But in my experience, China will, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile when it comes to things of this sort. What is the security risk to Canada if it does business with, with Huawei while the United States does not? It's, it's hard for me to emphasize adequately without getting into classified terrain how sig serious it is particularly for countries that are part of the Five Eyes mm -hmm. intelligence sharing uh, network with the United States, so UK, Canada, Aust Australia, New Zealand, the US, um, for those countries in particular to be reliant on Huawei technology. It gives the Chinese the ability, if they choose to use it, uh, to access all kinds of information, civilian intelligence, military, that could be very, very compromising. So I, much as I disagree with the Trump administration on a number of things, on this, their concern about Huawei, I believe they're right. And I believe they've handled it badly. There's all kinds of ways that they're um, doing things around this issue which are unhelpful. But on the very specific concern about Huawei, I think it's frankly quite justified. In terms of the relationship between Canada and the United States and the rest of the Five Eyes, if Canada does business with Huawei in the future, as a matter of protection, would the United States have to have a slightly different yes, security relationship we can. with Canada? Yes, and that will throw the Five Eyes collaboration, which is, serves the security interests of every Canadian and every American, into jeopardy. It, it, we just, it, it can't be done. You can't share. I don't see how we can share in the way we have. It's not a joke. It's truly serious. Your connections to Canada are very strong. Your husband, Ian, is a Canadian. He was a producer at, at this program. And yet I was surprised in reading your book the impact or the meaning of the moment of the death of Barbara Frump uh, for your family. Yeah. Um, Ian was my husband, uh, who was then my fiance, was one of her senior producers on the journal. And uh, he was quite close to her. And through Ian, I'd gotten to know Barbara. And she was a real champion of our impending marriage and very enthusiastic about it. And it, about three or four months before we were due to get married, I kind of freaked out. And I started to have real anxieties about whether or not um, I was ready to get married and could make that kind of commitment. We had been living together, moved out for a period of time. And one morning, as he's getting ready to fly back from South Africa, um, I wake up to CBC radio, as I always did, uh, and the news comes on that Barbara Frum had died. And I was shaken and really saddened. Um, and it made me realize that this was a relationship I wanted to be in for the rest of my life, that she was right about the, the fact that we were right together. 
And uh, I had this sort of moment of being, this moment of clarity where I realized that uh, I had to see if he would take me back. And I also had to tell him that Barbara had passed. So I, um, I tried to get him paged in the Johannesburg airport. And I guess they sent the message to come to the one, one of those white courtesy telephones. <laughs> and I said, honey, um, and we hadn't spoken in over a month. I said, you know, two things. Uh, one, I hope you'll take me back. I really do want to marry you. And two, I wanted you to know that Barbara had passed. I didn't want you to be surprised by that news. And... Uh, he said he'd take me back, um, and then uh, yeah, obviously we mourned Barbara's passing together. But she really was a catalyst in my thinking about uh, what mattered. She well, did us a, a huge service in a way. She'd be so proud of you now. Thank you. I guess she would probably ask you, what would it take for you to run? For what? <laughs> for, for office. For well, Whichever I mean, whichever one you want. I, it would take me being in the right place personally. Uh, we have a one kid in college, one kid still in high school in uh, her 11th grade year, who both of whom have suffered through eight years uh, of my service under President Obama. But that's not a no. It's not a no. And, you know, what I might run for, I mean, I've thought about the Senate. Uh, I've thought about, frankly, uh, other kinds of offices higher and lower. Have any of the Democratic hopefuls uh, picked up the phone and called you? Yes. For advice, not for anything no, else. You're not, you're not, <laughs> are we going to see your name on a ticket? No, no, I can't imagine that. But yes. Also not a no. I can't imagine it. I'm not, I've not endorsed anybody yet, um, but I, there are several strong candidates in my judgment that I think would make um, excellent presidents and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll end up with one of them. A year from now. A year from now. Thank you very much. Thank Adrian. you. Really, really, really appreciate Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate it. Yeah, you make me cry about I'm sorry. Barbara I'm from. Jeez. <laughs> Still ahead on the national, tracking the every move of an unwelcome predator. All right, who did it? Who released their goldfish? What's behind the goldfish boom in Canadian waters? We'll be right back. I'm Marion Warnica, sitting in for Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, the controversy around Quebec's new values test as it goes into effect this week. Some say it encourages racism. Others argue it protects Quebecers. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. They're pets and now pests. Goldfish have invaded parts of Lake Ontario. Casper Sea tagged along with researchers last summer as they embarked on a unique catch and release operation to try to gain the upper hand. We started tagging goldfish in 2017. Near Hamilton, Ontario, aquatic research biologist Christine Boston and her team Yay. are on a mission. Oh, get the guy. A mission to rid the waters of an unwanted and unwelcomed predator, goldfish. My, my, <laughs> and not the tiny orange colored variety in aquariums. What are they doing in the harbor? These are meant to be in a fish bowl. Uh, these fish are getting into the harbor. Uh, <laughs> either through um, active release, people are releasing their pets into the harbor or they're getting into the harbor, I think, through um, people's private ponds or stormwater management ponds. So why are they so big? I don't remember goldfish uh, being that big. Uh, I think they just, they have the resources. They have an unlimited supply of food here in the harbor for them. That's good for the goldfish, which are not only surviving, but thriving. It's doing well and our native fish aren't doing well. Uh, it competes uh, for the habitat that our fish need. Um, to spawn and reproduce. It, they generate a lot of um, turbidity in the water, which uh, decreases the water quality. Can you grab the forceps and pull that out for me? Christine and her team want to learn more about goldfish. Got it. 
So they're using something called acoustic telemetry that will help track and monitor their movement. So this tag is a transmitter. It should last three to five years. It's going to emit a, a sound, like a, a pulse, every three to five minutes. Um, it has a depth sensor on it, so we can tell what depth the fish is at um, at any time when this fish is swimming in the vicinity of one of our uh, receivers. The team works swiftly, trying to minimize the stress on the fish. Goldfish are considered destructive, and not much is known about them. There we go. The team is hopeful their work will shed some light on their behavior. Now scientists at the University of Nevada are finding them by the hundreds in Lake Tahoe, and they are monsters, guys. Okay, maybe they're Around the globe, they are goldfish are invading lakes and ponds. All right, who did it? Who released their goldfish? Anglers even capturing monster-sized fish. Huge goldfish. Some lakes even shutting down fishing because of goldfish infestations. So this is Coots Paradise. So this is the harbors just on the other side of the, uh, the fishway over here, which you'll see. So Coots Paradise. Ecologist Kyle Mataya has also noticed a spike in the goldfish population. Pull them right up to the, so they can get out of the step as tight as we can get to the front. Kyle and his team work to keep the common carp out of this nature reserve. The carp is an invasive fish and destroys habitat and precious spawning grounds. So with the help of this multi-million dollar fish barrier, the carp are diverted and that's helped decrease their population by more than half. But at the same time, Kyle says there's been an explosion of goldfish. What do you figure is the cause for this spike in goldfish? It's tough to say exactly. Um, I know even ourselves, we're, we're kind of puzzled as to why, you know, the goldfish are, are coming up in such high numbers as they are. The goldfish may be filling that niche where the carp have been removed from. Lovable pet or undesirable pest. Whatever the reasons for the goldfish boom, scientists have one singular message. Don't flush your pet goldfish down the toilet and don't discard them in lakes and ponds. They're competing with our native species. And right now, there's an imbalance in the system. Yeah. We don't have enough of these native fishes that, that we need to have to have in a healthy ecosystem. But for the good of science, these tagged goldfish are allowed to return to the waters, providing valuable data that could one day help restore these wetlands. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Hamilton. And since that story first aired, researchers say they've learned a lot. For one thing, they found the goldfish spend winter in deeper waters and move to shallower locations in the spring. And knowing that could make it easier to control the population. After the break, imagine driving through this. Looks like a sick video game. What happens when tumbleweed takes over? The dangerous and surprising discovery. Next, in tonight's moment. It wasn't the way anyone planned to spend New Year's Eve. High winds blew a thicket of tumbleweed onto a Washington State highway, trapping lots of people in their cars. It was dubbed Tumblegeddon. The tumbleweeds piling as high as 20 to 30 feet. This strange roadblock is our moment. We have confirmed no one is in this car. But so about 6.30 p.m. last night on New Year's Eve, we started receiving 911 calls of tumbleweeds in the roadway. We had about five passenger cars and one 18-wheeler uh, semi-truck and trailer uh, stuck in the tumbleweeds. Obviously, this is pretty frightening uh, for the people involved. Uh, it's not very funny to them. And, you know, that's not the way that they envision their uh, New Year's Eve ball dropping. We stayed there, um, called out our Department of Transportation. Uh, they deployed two snow plows. We were there for 10 hours. Luckily, no one was injured. This is very unusual. Uh, I've worked in this area for over 20 years. We experience uh, blowing tumbleweeds every every year, uh, but I have never, ever seen cars, including an 18-wheeler, stuck in tumbleweeds. 
So if you have an extra few minutes tonight, you might want to go on YouTube and search Tumbleweed and there's all kinds of stuff there. Unusual but not unheard of for Tumbleweed to engulf, for example, a small town. It's happened uh, at least a couple of times I saw. And in this case, the perfect thing for clearing Tumbleweed, in case you need the advice, is the snowplow. But if cars are there and perhaps people, you got to go slowly. Just so you know, that is the National for January the 1st. Happy New Year and good night.